Chapter 9 From this time, until I arrived at the Palace of Fairyland, I can attempt no consecutive account of my wanderings and adventures. Everything henceforward existed for me in its relation to my attendant. What influence he exercised upon everything into conduct which which I was brought may be understood from a few detached instances. To begin with this very day in which he first joined me, after I had walked heartlessly along for two or three hours, I was very weary, and lay down to rest in a most delightful part of the forest, carpeted with wild flowers. I lay for half an hour in a dull repose, and then got up to pursue my way. The flowers on the spot where I had lain were crushed to the earth, but I saw they would soon lift their heads and rejoice again in the sun and air. Not so for those on which my shadow had lain. The very outline of it could be traced in the withered, lifeless grass and the scorched and shriveled flowers which stood there, dead and hopeless of any resurrection. I shuddered and hastened away with its sad forebodings. In a few days I had reason to dread an extension of its baleful influences from the fact that it was no longer confined to one position in regard to myself. Hitherto, when seized with an irresistible desire to look on my evil demon, which longing would unaccountably seize me at any moment, returning at longer or shorter intervals sometimes, every minute, I had to turn my head backwards and look over my shoulder, in which position, as long as I could retain it, I was fascinated. But one day, having come out on a clear grassy hill which commanded a glorious prospect, though of what I cannot now tell, my shadow moved round and came in front of me, and, presently, a new manifestation increased my distress, for it began to coruscate and shoot out on all sides a radiation of dim shadow. These rays of gloom issued from the central shadow as from a black sun, lengthening and shortening with continual change. But wherever a ray struck, that part of earth, or sea, or sky became void and desert and sad to my heart. On this, the first development of its new power, one ray shot out beyond the rest, seeming to lengthen infinitely, until it smote the great sun on the face, which withered and darkened beneath the blow. I turned away and went on. The shadow retreated to its former position, and when I looked again, it had drawn in all its spears of darkness and followed like a dog at my heels. Once, as I passed by a cottage, there came out a lovely fairy child with two wondrous toys, one in each hand. The one was a tube through which the fairy-gifted poet looks when he beholds the same thing everywhere. The other, that through which he looks when he combines into new forms of loveliness those images of beauty, which his own choice has gathered from all regions wherein he has traveled. Round the child's head was an aureole of emanating rays. As I looked at him in wonder and delight, round crept from behind me the something dark, and the child stood in my shadow. Straight away he was a commonplace boy, with a rough, broad-brimmed straw hat through which brim the sun shone from behind. The toys he carried were a multiplying glass and a kaleidoscope. I sighed and departed. One evening, as a great silent flood of western gold flowed through an avenue in the woods, down the stream, just as when I saw him first came the sad knight, riding on his chestnut steed. But his armor did not shine half so red as when I saw him first. Many a blow of mighty sword and axe, turned aside by the strength of his mail, and glancing it down the surface, had swept from its path the fretted rust, and the glorious steel had answered the kindly bow with the thanks of returning light. These streaks and spots made his armor look like the floor of a forest in the sunlight. His forehead was higher than before, for the contracting wrinkles were nearly gone, and the sadness that remained on his face was the sadness of dewy summer twilight, not that of a frosty autumn morn. He, too, had met the altar maiden in his eye, but he had plunged into a torrent of mighty deeds, and the stain was nearly washed away. No shadow followed him. He had not entered the dark house. He had not had time to open the closet door. When he ever looked in, I said to myself, Must his shadow find him some day? But I could not answer my own questions. We traveled together for two days, and I began to love him. It was plain that he suspected my story in some degree, and I saw him once or twice looking curiously and anxiously at my attendant gloom, which all this time had remained very obsequiously behind me, 
and I offered no explanation, and he asked none. Shame at my neglect of his warning, and a horror which shrunk from even alluding to its cause, kept me silent, till, on the evening of the second day, some noble words from my companion roused all my heart, and I was at the point of falling on his neck and telling him the whole story, seeking, if not for helpful advice, for of that I was hopeless, yet for the comfort of sympathy. And round slid the shadow and enwrapped my friend, and I could not trust him. The glory of his brow vanished. The light of his eye grew cold, and I held my peace. The next morning we parted. But the most dreadful thing of all was that I now began to feel something like satisfaction in the presence of the shadow. I began to be rather vain of my attendant, saying to myself, In a land like this, with so many illusions everywhere, I need his aid to disenchant the things around me. He does away with all appearances and shows me things in their true color and form. And I am not one to be fooled with the vanities of the common crowd. I will not see beauty where there is none. I will dare to behold things as they are. And if I live in a waste instead of a paradise, I will live knowing where I live. But of this certain exercise of his power which soon followed quite cured me, turning my feelings toward him once more into loathing and distrust. It was thus. One bright noon, a little maiden joined me, coming through the wood in a direction at right angles to my path. She came along singing and dancing, happy as a child, though she seemed almost a woman. In her hands, now on one, now on the other, she carried a small globe, bright and clear as the purest crystal. This seemed at once her plain thing and her greatest treasure. At one moment you would have thought her utterly careless of it, and at another overwhelmed with anxiety for its safety. But I believe she was taking care of it all the time, perhaps not least when least occupied about it. She stopped by me with a smile and bade me good day with the sweetest voice. I felt a wonderful lightning to the child, for she produced on me more the impression of a child, though my understanding told me different. We talked a little, and then walked on together in the direction I had been pursuing. I asked her about the globe she carried, but getting no definite answer, I held out my hand to take it. She drew back and said, but smiling almost invitingly the while, you must not touch it. Then, after a moment's pause, or if you do, it must be very gently. I touched it with a finger. A slight vibratory motion arose in it, accompanied her, perhaps manifested by a faint, sweet sound. I touched it again, and the sound increased. I touched it a third time. A tiny torrent of harmony rolled out of this little globe. She would not let me touch it any more. We traveled on together all that day. She left me when twilight came on, but next day, at noon, she met me as before, and again we traveled till evening. The third day she came once more at noon, and we walked on together. Now, though we had talked about a great many things connected with Fairyland and the life she had led hitherto, I had never been able to learn anything about this globe. This day, however, as we on, the shadow guided round and wrapped the maiden. It could not change her. But my desire to know about the globe, when its gloom began to waver as with an inward light and to shoot out flashes of many-colored flame, grew irresistible. I put out both my hands and laid hold on it. In the sound as before, the sound rapidly increased till it grew a low tempest of harmony, and the globe trembled and quivered and throbbed between my hands. I had not the heart to pull away from the maiden, though I held it in spite of her attempts to take it from me. Yes, I shame to say, in spite of her prayers and, at last, her tears. The music went on growing in, intensity and complication of tones, and the globe vibrated and heaved, till at last it burst in our hands, and the black vapor broke upwards from out of it, then turned, as if blown sideways, and enveloped the maiden, hiding even the shadow in its blackness. She held fast the fragments which I abandoned, and fled from me into the forest in the direction when she had come, wailing like a child and crying, You have broken my globe. My globe is broken. My globe is broken. I followed her in the hope of comforting her, but I had not pursued her far before a sudden cold gust of wind bowed the treetops above us and swept through their stems around us. A great cloud overspread the day, and a fierce tempest came on in which I lost sight of her. It lies heavy on my heart to this hour. At night, ere I fall asleep, often, whatever I may be thinking, I suddenly hear her voice crying out, You have broken my globe. My globe is broken. Ah, 
my globe. Here I will mention one more strange thing. But whether this peculiarity was owing to my shadow at all, I am not able to assure myself. I came to a village, the inhabitants of which could not at first sight be distinguished from the dwellers in our land. They rather avoided that sought my company, though they were very pleasant when I addressed them. But at last I observed that whenever I came within a certain distance of any one of them, which distance, however, varied with different individuals, the whole appearance of the person began to change. This change increased in degree as I approached. When I receded to the former distance, the former appearance was restored. The nature of the change was grotesque, following no fixed rule. The nearest resemblance to it that I know is the distortion produced in your countenance when you look at it as if reflected in a concave or convex surface, say, either side of a bright spoon. On this phenomenon I first became aware in rather a ludicrous way. My host's daughter was a very pleasant girl, who made herself more agreeable to me than most of those about me. For some days my companion shadow had been less obtrusive than usual, and such was the reaction of the spirits occasioned by the simple mitigation of torment that, although I had cause enough besides to be gloomy, I felt light and comparatively happy. My impression is that she was quite aware of the law of appearances that existed between the people of the place and myself, and had resolved to amuse herself at my expense. For one evening, after some jesting and raillery, she somehow or other provoked me to attempt to kiss her. But she was very well defended from any assault of this kind. Her countenance became of a sudden absurdly hideous. The pretty mouth was elongated, otherwise amplified sufficiently to have loud of six simultaneous kisses. I started back in bewildered dismay. She burst into the merriest fit of laughter and ran from the room. I soon found that the same undefinable law of change operated between me and all the other villagers, and that, to feel I was in pleasant company, it was absolutely necessary for me to discover and observe the right focal distance between myself and each one with whom I had to do. This done, all went pleasantly enough. Whether, when I happened to neglect this precaution, I presented to them an equally ridiculous appearance, I did not ascertain but I presume that the alteration was common to the approximating parties. I was likewise unable to determine whether I was a necessary party to the production of this strange transformation, or whether it took place as well under the given circumstances between the inhabitants themselves.